Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a uh, more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. Hey, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And we are here to discuss our June 2023 book club pick, We Have Always Been Here by Lena Nguyen, a sci-fi horror thriller that, man, really lives up to that. It's been, it's been a while since we read uh, a good sci-fi book for a book club, and this one definitely did not disappoint. I had a lot of fun reading it. Yeah, it was definitely a change of pace. Uh, we've been reading a lot of, I guess, uh, quote unquote, charming books, a lot of slice of life, a lot of um, I mean, we've read um, thrillers, we've read uh, mystery novels, but uh, the last like creepy read, creepy vibes read that we've read uh, was The Hole by Heyong Pyun, and that was a couple of months ago. Uh, so um, I... I was pretty excited to read this book. Yeah, I mean, the whole had the creepy vibes, definitely. But there's just something about um, science fiction and science fiction horror that I guess because it's couched in like extrapolating from current issues and science and speculation, um, it just feels like we're looking into what might actually happen in real life, right? I mean, sci-fi is always going to be commentary on our society today and society's anxieties. So, of course, it's going to feel like uh, it, it feels almost like dystopian. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it in, in terms of like world building and uh, like horror tropes in this book. Yeah. Um, so before we get started, um, as always, this is your standard spoiler warning. We will be discussing the entirety of Lena Wynn's book. So that means we'll be diving deep into characters and plot points, which means if you don't want to get spoiled, and this is a book that has like a central mystery to spoil, feel free to stop listening now if you care about being spoiled and then come back to the podcast after you finish reading the book and listen to our discussion. Um, but with that, uh, Vera, can you start us off with the book description? All right. Misanthropic psychologist Dr. Grace Park is placed on the Deucalion, a survey ship headed to an icy planet in an unexplored galaxy. Her purpose is to observe the 13 human crew members aboard the ship, all specialists in their own fields, as they assess the colonization potential of the planet Eos. But frictions develop as Park befriends the androids of the ship, preferring their company over the baffling complexity of humans, while the rest of the crew treats them with suspicion and even 
outright hostility. Shortly after landing, the crew finds themselves trapped on the ship by a radiation storm with no means of communication or escape until it passes. And that's when things begin to fall apart. Park's patients are falling prey to waking nightmares of helpless, tongueless insanity. The androids are behaving strangely, and there are no windows aboard the ship. Paranoia is closing in, and soon Park is forced to confront the fact that nothing, neither her crew, nor their mission, nor the mysterious Eos itself, is as it seems. Yeah. I mean, this book definitely gave, like, similar vibes to the original Alien movie. Um, A bunch of corporate employees get sent on a mission to retrieve something of corporate importance, and scary stuff happens. And, um, I mean, I was surprised by the number of i mean i guess the themes were pretty straightforward right the the main theme of the book is exploring self-determination and what freedom means to you know people to androids to <laughs> corporate employees um but there were a lot of i mean this book had like three separate like story threads like concurrently running right it had the story of um, Grace Park on the ship. It had the story of a stranded merchant vessel and it had the story of Grace Park's past in um, New Diego. I was really impressed that like Lena was able to like keep everything together. See, that's my main critique of, of this book. Um, I, I, I can already tell that Marvin and I are going to have uh, differing opinions on a lot of things uh, with this book. I felt like there were too much, too many things going on. And I don't think uh, Lena stuck the landing all the way but i did love elements from each uh (laughs) storylines yeah that's interesting um i actually really liked this book and um i thought lena did stick the landing in my opinion so curious to hear your thoughts um about it but i guess to start off because this book had so many threads going um i was trying to figure out what's the best way to go about our discussion and i guess we can we should start off with our main character, um, Dr. Grace Park, who is the deputy psychologist on this ship. Um, she's meant to be kind of like the main psychologist assistant, but gets thrust into the main psychologist psychologist role when shit starts going down on the ship. And she was a really interesting character to follow because um, she is someone who does not like people, despite making the study of humans her like her area of expertise and much of the book is kind of her dealing with her social anxiety and like not wanting to deal with stuff but having to deal with stuff because it's her job uh, what did you think of grace park oh uh, i thought she was i think this was one of the strengths of the novel i really like dr grace park's uh characterization i love the fact that uh, she was more comfortable in the company of androids than humans. Uh, I really like the dynamics between uh, the crew members and her uh, because she's non-conscripted and because she's also um, considered strange because she doesn't really have this affinity um, to be to play nice with, with uh, humans. And also they think that she's a spy because um, she's a psychologist and she's... Well, also they think because that, she is, essentially. She's like a corporate... Like her loyalties are with the the corporation sent to monitor everyone's yeah, well being yeah. as opposed to like there for their actual well being. Yeah. So yeah. like the situation that she's put in plus like her personality is definitely not um conducive to being <laughs> uh like uh, to to being welcomed as part of the crew. So I really liked uh that dynamic and uh she kind of read to me as um neurodivergent. Mm. Simply because, like, she thought in very, uh, I guess, logical ways. And she, like, preferred androids being able to, like, tell the truth as it is. And being able to just uh, have a simplistic relationship where it's, like, black and white. (laughs) Um, But obviously that changes as the androids become uh, Yeah, her bewilderment as the androids become more human as T story goes along was, like, a source of many anxieties for her because, you know, the world was... The rules have changed, and she does not like it when the rules change on her. Um, But I also like that despite her not 
enjoying dealing with the complicated emotions of regular people. She's also very lonely, right? She wants the company of people. She wants to feel like she's a part of something as well. And I thought that was a really good, you know, juxtaposition of like even antisocial, socially anxious people. They're still people. They still want companionship. Yeah, I think humans in general are social creatures. Like you can't live in complete isolation. I feel like that is just impossible as a human being. And everybody has different tolerance levels when it comes to, uh, you know, being social. Yeah. And we learn a lot about Grace um, throughout the book because there are chapters in the book that delve into her past. And it's justified in the book as her like having dreams of her past. And surprisingly, that becomes plot relevant later on in the book, which I was really, I, I thought it was really cool. But we learned that another one of the tension points between her and the crew is she is one of the few Earthborn crew members, or probably the only Earthborn crew members, right? This is a future human society that has colonized space. And so, um, similar to, like, The Expanse, like, now there are tensions between people who are born or live out in space and people who are stuck on Earth. And people from space or born in space are there because, um, mostly because their families are conscripted and they're there as indentured servants. And so they're like of a working class compared to people on Earth who they seem as more privileged. And so there's that tension there. And this is a thing that I really like in science fiction, which is that even in the future, even as we like move to other planets class divides carry on because the fuel of space exploration is capitalism and corporate interests and you know who is right now taking the lead in space exploration corporations you know yeah it's been it's weird timing that we are reading (laughs) this book um not just with what is happening in the world of space exploration and private companies building their own rockets and also trying to sell land, which we (laughs) haven't even begun to, um, like we don't have a planet to colonize or even have like space colonies, but they're already like booking people to have ownership, which is (laughs) really uh, which is really like dystopian <laughs> capitalism. Yeah, it's like, um, but it's also like really funny that we're reading this book like um, within like the same weeks of the submersible uh, <laughs> incident that happened recently, and it's it's just like yeah, pri- private company is like monopolizing and capitalizing on space exploration and like. That's that was like a huge theme. And I thought that was pretty interesting (laughs) when it came to world building. (laughs) Yeah. Well, at least the submarine incident only involved rich people who got in over their heads and not like there weren't. I don't think there were any like working class people on that submarine that had to die for a rich person's aspirations. Yeah, it was it was a weird couple weeks reading this book when uh, the submersible (laughs) incident happened because it just like my thoughts went into billionaires and uh, their desires to just you know do whatever they want without consequences (laughs) yeah and also how the future governments are corporate in nature and i thought that was really interesting too um and you know going back to um grace dr park being from Earth, um, I really liked how Lena incorporated like environmental calamity into her world building. Like, what did you think of the comeback as a world building piece? I thought it was interesting. Um, I had to suspend my belief on the idea that plants will uh, just kind of like hyper grow in order to take back the planet, but it is a cool idea. And it it's a very like me, Final Fantasy idea, right? Like the planet rebelling against, like, yeah, kind of. I mean, it kind of <laughs> reminded me of the happening by M Night Shyamalan. <laughs> um, not to spoil that movie, but it had plants and revenge against humanity and uh, pollution and corruption. <laughs> but I thought I thought it was really interesting on how the biodomes were. Uh, like functioned in on Earth as as a way to combat the comeback, <laughs> and yeah, it was like it was very interesting, and I could just see it like visually. It's like cinematically, it looks it would probably look really beautiful. 
uh, just like this wilderness and having like all these uh, modern buildings being overrun with plants and kind of becoming ruins. So that was like a cool imagery. Yeah. And I really liked that um, the biodome that Dr. Park um, lived in was called New Diego. Um, and I kind of wish we got some more San Diego landmarks. I don't know if it literally is San Diego, but it seems like it's it was like a coastal town. But I do like the idea that in these biodomes, it's not like a utopia either. Like it's very, um, space is very limited and they're using like, random uh knickknacks to build furniture um everything is kind of uh like janky (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's not an ideal place to live which is why people are conscripting to go into space and have a better life on the colonies at the same time though there's still some eugenics tech is up and running and you have like advanced androids so it's an interesting juxtaposition. Um, I think part of it is just because uh, because of the comeback, you can't really build much. But technology still works and technology development still works. I also like the idea that uh, because the plants have rebelled against humanity and overtaken uh, pretty much the landscape of every single continent, uh, there's just like an overdose of oxygen. There's not <laughs> enough um carbon dioxide for humans to be able to live uh like comfortably or like you'll get poisoned yeah Yeah, or safely so it i thought that was really interesting too uh yeah and this ecological devastation leads to families conscripting with the isf which is the governing body of the frontiers of space like they're in charge of space exploration and are essentially like the de facto world government of the future um, because they hold the key to humanity's survival at this point, right? Um, and essentially, to book travel t- into the colonies, people conscript themselves, which, which is essentially entering themselves into indentured servitude to work for the ISF. And in return, ISF provides for them and their family, but also essentially keeps their family hostage. Yeah, pretty much the ISF is a totalitarian uh, government. Mm -hmm. And not only do they keep your family hostage, they have access to your money. They have access to your uh, living accommodations. And for a lot of people who live on these space colonies and they are conscripted, if they lose their livelihoods if they get kicked out by isf then they are exiled to earth and they don't get to live in a biodome either so it is pretty much sentencing them to death yeah and i think this is the one frustrating part of dr park's character which you know don't get me wrong adds to the story and adds to the tension but like her inability to kind of see past her own privilege um was to me like a frustrating part because She's so close, right? She can understand the plight of androids, but not the plight of the working class. I mean, yeah, I think that is also a theme in this book on how thin that uh, divide is between uh, human labor versus uh, android labor, because they're both indentured servitude, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah, or one is an organic being that needs to provide food and shelter and compensation for, and the other is a machine that you only need to maintain and you can always build more of, which is another anxiety of today's world where AI is becoming uh, more and more of a actual, like it's no longer a theoretical threat. And now it's an actual threat to labor, right? Like not just manual labor, but also like now creative labor too. Yeah, I think it's important to make the distinction between automation and AI. Obviously, AI can be used as automation, but automation is pretty much robots that are used to follow a set of rules that are set by uh, humans, and they just follow orders, and they are used to replace human labor. And companies replace the companies replace humans with automation, not just for efficiency, but also for profit gains because they don't have to pay these machines, which is like a big deal in today's society. And then you have AI, which are robots that are 
able to make decisions on their own, obviously with human input, but as they are self-learning and as they gain more um, data, they're able to make more sophisticated decisions. And right now, like we have um, kind of a crisis with uh, AI being exploited by companies to use use them for creative labor. Um, you see like ChatGPT and you see um, a lot of like AI being made in order to replace uh, creatives, not like writers just in, specifically right now. Yeah, like. writers, um, which is like a reason why, uh, which is like part of the reason why the writer strike is going on right now. It's not like the main focus, but it is <laughs> something that people are worried about. And um, ChatGPT has been. Uh, it's not just ChatGPT. I think there's another uh, AI program, but it's been pretty much stealing other people's writings online from bloggers, fanfic writers, from articles. Um, and they're pretty much like learning from uh, human writing on the internet. But, and, yeah. and, you know, like in a perfect world, that shouldn't be a concern. But the concern is the fact that it is replacing human creatives and taking people's jobs away. Yeah. And companies being like, okay, well, I guess I don't have to, like, why should I, um, why should I pay humans to create content for me when I can just get content from a computer? And then that like leads into the debate of like, well, like what is uh, an original idea? And like, can AI actually, you know, be as good as humans when it comes to creating stories? And I think it's really interesting now because uh, growing up, I remember like automation, like, you know, people will talk about tech and saying how it's going to replace menial jobs and labor uh, heavy jobs or, or I guess like manual labor heavy jobs. And uh, we used to joke saying like, well, I guess like the the artists and the writers are safe because that's not like something that robots can do. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and that's like one of the first things that companies are going for in terms of replacing uh, people. Yeah. And when we talk about the AI in like science fiction, I think inevitably we also talk about the singularity, right? This idea that at some point AI will reach a point where it will become self-aware, right? It will evolve beyond its original programming. And <laughs> that usually is the herald to the robot apocalypse. I thought it was pretty funny how uh, in this world, humans are saying like, oh, we can't have an Android uprising. So we're going to make sure that uh, robots can't self-maintain themselves and they <laughs> need a human to do all of like the repairs and upgrades. Yeah. I mean, it's a valid concern and something that i can see like if androids ever become a thing that congress here would you know pass that regulation right um just to ease the fears of of the general populace um i guess to jump ahead i thought it was really interesting so there is a in addition to the main mystery there is like this subplot of like the androids on the ship starting to gain self-determination and sentience Dr. Park starts noticing that the androids are starting to communicate with each other, learn from each other, um, lie, right? Like beyond their programming. And she starts getting really freaked out by that as well. And I thought it was interesting as the androids start to create their own society, um, they have the opportunity to create something new. But the robots are still getting all their bad habits from like learning from humans because they were created by humans. They were created in their image. I mean, that is an issue that we have with AIs today um, because people are flawed and they have their own implicit biases. Um, it's like a whole deal with, uh, I guess, like not not facial recognition, but there are a there's AI right now that uh, pretty much HR people use to help find recruits. And 
Um, obviously, it's like helpful for HR people to sift through all of these resumes, but also there's implicit bias. <laughs> so it, they're, you know, yeah. in in their process, they're they're um, already like excluding people without like certain um, favorable traits. Like, oh, are they? Are they black? Are they? Did they go to yeah. this school? Yeah, <laughs> stuff like that. So, I mean, AI as it is today only functions if you give it a lot of data to crunch through and find trends and essentially like regression models to model its decisions around. And we talk about this a lot when we talk about like representation in media, right? Like, there's a reason why it's hard to get, like, say, an Asian centered film produced by a major studio and that's because if you crunch the numbers there's not enough data to prove that that is a financially sound solution and so you know recently there's been more asian content but if you notice they're all kind of similar right and it's because based on the models this is the type of asian story that makes money and so that precludes like you said like new thought right like ai right now can only make decisions based on past performance and the past performance is also biased then future decisions based on those models will also be biased and that's kind of not to go back into current events but that was the central kind of argument for things like affirmative action in schools right yeah <laughs> it was a dark week for us <laughs> in asian america um yeah, I thought it was interesting how um, Lena implemented the idea of uh, androids learning from humans, but also learning from each other. And then you also have situations where humans are learning what it's like to be an android and not having control over their own decisions and bodies. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't necessarily body horror, but definitely gave those vibes. And that's something I really like about science fiction, especially once I touch on cosmic horror themes. Like one of the themes that I really like about sci-fi is the idea that like space is unknown. There's so many different things humanity doesn't know about. And the idea that if you do find something alien, it might not take the form of something that you can recognize. And I like that it was paired up with a story of like a essentially a proletariat uprising, right? Like um, throughout the story, um, Dr. Park is dealing with like a dwindling number of her crew members because people are getting fridged. infected. <laughs> yeah, fridged, literally, um, because they were picking up this like psychological infection. I was actually quite surprised when they revealed that while the while the psychological like phenomenon was affecting people's minds, um, the actual like fridging and decisions to fridge people, like put them to crowd sleep was the backdrop to like a mutiny on the crew and where all the conscripted members were trying, like wanted to take over the ship so they can like create a colony for their families. And I, <laughs> something that was really interesting while reading this book is I like, it was hard to figure out who to root for at times because like, I personally am inclined to side with the the working class like rebellers like Sagara like despite being someone who is on Park's side and like invested in protecting her I did not agree with his politics at all. Yeah, Sagara is in an interesting position because he is also non-conscripted. He used to be conscripted, but because uh he fought in some of the wars that ISF was uh the privacy wars, which is an interesting, like, I really enjoyed, like, kind of learning about that as well, which is like... It was like the privacy wars and, like, the outer space wars. And I <laughs> yeah. don't know what the outer space wars was, but it was just kind of referenced I'm sure it's all just rebellions. Yeah, yeah, rebellions of, like, the outer planets trying to, like, again, find self-determination and independence from, like, corporate control. Yeah, so he, like, got medals and, you know, he was freed from his indentured servitude, but he still decided to serve ISF. Yeah, it seemed like he was just really cynical about the concept of, like, rebelling against the ISF. Like, he thought it was pointless, that it just created chaos and death and it wasn't worth it. So, to prevent... Because um, his backstory is his wife died during a terrorist attack during one of these wars. 
And so not only does he have a personal vendetta against quote unquote terrorist rebels, but he also is of the mind that like the ISF is in control. There's no point in rebelling. And it seems like he really believes that like in serving their interests, even though they exploit people, it keeps people alive and safe. Yeah, it's like better for yeah. the greater good, which, <laughs> like, you know, which the greater makes, yeah. good, I, yeah, it's it's a whole argument. So it was like, yeah, like, I get that you're like supposed to be like this heroic guy, but you're kind of a bootlicker. And I don't know if I like, and I do like that. I was constantly afraid that he would become like a secondary love interest because there were some tensioning scenes between him and, and Park, right? Did you feel that? No, not at all. Oh. <laughs> um, I did not feel it at all. Although, like, there was one scene where Full Breach, who was the, I guess, like, the the other love interest. <laughs> Although I, like, I wonder if he really was a love interest because Grace kind of had, like, this very complicated relationship <laughs> with Full Breach. Um, you know, there's, there's, like a, there's, like, a short scene where Full Breach sees uh grace looking at sagara and he's just like oh is there something there and (laughs) she can and because grace uh grace's ability is to read body language and be able to tell what people are when people are lying or what they're thinking through body language she's like oh he thinks that we're like I have a thing with Sagara, but that's not I, the case. <laughs> I mean, I did. I mean, for me, there were scenes where it seems like Sagara had a soft spot for Park, and it gave like early Darcy vibes, right? Someone who like was very, very standoffish, but like obviously is like taking interest. That's more than just like professional interest in in Doctor Park. Maybe that's just me, though. <laughs> I, don't know, I would say it was like more like for me, it felt more of like a guardian and like ward relationship, I guess. <laughs> Cause like I feel like Park, she like you said, she's very unaware of her own privilege. And I feel like she's very naive when it comes to like ISF politics. Like she understands that ISF takes uh their conscripted families into hostage situations, but she doesn't really quite understand or empathize with like the fears and anxieties and like, just like how much the human cost is. And you have Sagara who's just like, I understand what it is, but it's not as just, it's not as simple as um, just like designated ISF as the bad guy and uh, the rebel rebellers as like the good guys. (laughs) So I feel like it was kind of, like they kind of had more of uh, a relationship where like Sagara is like opening uh, Grace Park's eyes um, and, and like I guess and, I mean and trying to indoctrinate her into his point of view um, and it doesn't help that like the rebelling crew members are all kind of dicks <laughs> but. I don't know. At the end, I was still like, I was more sympathetic to their plight than to like the ISFs. Of course. Yeah. Cause yeah. we're not <laughs> like, we're not fans of totalitarian governments or capitalism or yeah. uh, private companies monopolizing uh, industries and taking over <laughs> people's lives. Yeah. Uh, um, but so but I, I will yeah. say, I will say, I thought it was interesting with the privacy wars because in, in my personal experience, I feel like I've seen people give up their privacy for convenience more often than <laughs> not. So I was like, huh, like, it's weird that there was uh, this war on privacy and like people were just like, yeah, like you can't you can't just use our footage. Um, you can't just use like our images for entertainment. And I'm like, well, a lot of people have like done that already here in on yeah Earth, so. <laughs> so it was just Me. like funny how like they won that argument and yeah. isf is like afraid of lawsuits and i'm like i feel like they would not like <laughs> they would win that war completely the isf i mean i mean i want to believe in the world where if enough people say no because i and i think there is a generation like there's a generation of kids now growing up realizing that their entire lives are online And, like, suing their parents. Um, There's been a lot of articles recently, actually, of, like, children of mommy bloggers and family bloggers who are, like, suing their parents for breach of their privacy. But also, like, I'm thinking about, like, 
facial identification at airports. Like you could opt out on that, by the way, and you totally should because uh, the like governments and agencies should not have any biological data on you because they will use it for their own profits yeah. at one point and to train their AI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you know, throughout the story. Dr. Park is trying to figure out why people are getting sick and what's going on. And while it is revealed that a lot of it is due to this brewing mutiny among the crew members, it is also exasperated by this like cosmic phenomenon on the planet Eos, in which there exists like some sort of gravity effect field, right? That like folds dimensions together. Um, and this is where the, the science gets a little complicated and a little wonky right like at the very least it's a little simpler than like the three body problems um physics and dimensionality but i thought this was like what did you think about like the the supernatural elements of of eos i will say that um like when the physics was being explained i was like i am not an astrophysicist <laughs> but i can already tell this is absolute bs and it just feels very doctor whoey where with a lot of like hand waving and i'm like okay well i can suspend my disbelief because you know i'm not like a heavy uh like hard leaning sci-fi <laughs> like person like i um, maybe it's because like I prefer fantasy over sci-fi, so I could like suspend my disbelief a little bit more in terms of like getting through the plot. Yeah. But I thought the I thought the cosmetic sciences was kind of kind of weak, kind of watered down. It's the opposite of the three body problem, like you said, where I was like, this is way too much information. <laughs> I do not need to know every single mechanics to understand how this planet works. Um but yeah, like the physics, I thought it was kind of, um, I don't know, even even as someone who reads sci-fi, I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about this. Um, <laughs> I didn't mind it. I guess for me, I kind of, I got the gist of what they were trying to explain. And I just accepted it. Um, I did like the idea of like consciousness being a dimension and collapsing on itself. I thought that was, you know. In terms of like a supernatural phenomenon, I thought that was interesting and served the themes. Uh, but yeah, like I'm also not an astrophysicist. I did read a couple of reviews of people who are really into hard sci-fi, like bouncing after realizing that this book doesn't have like the hard science that they were looking for. Um, but I thought thematically the phenomenon worked for me. Yeah, thematically. But this is where I like had issues with like the the sticking of the landing, you know? I'm just like, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Like, I get I get the reason why Lena chose the fold and why, like, how, like, dimensions are collapsing on each other and how co consciousness is also, like, a dimension. But I was like, oh, it's, like, really... Uh, I was just like, I, I understand the themes, but I just, like, can't get behind, like, the execution of... The science to back it up i guess um but i thought the horror aspect of the book um you get that because grace doesn't know what is happening and she hasn't stepped out onto the planet so like the planet is like a complete black hole to her she's just like i don't know what it looks like what like what to expect yeah i don't know like wh why people are getting nightmares like have they come in come in contact with spores or something <laughs> i mean it's essentially the book is like a haunted house story because you're stuck on this ship um you're cut off from the world the walls are shifting and like the androids and people are starting to get possessed and so you know it wasn't like i didn't feel like it was creepy not in like the oh no there's ghosts here but like i don't know what's going on and um it does feel like the crew members are in mortal peril and that Dr. Park is the only person who seems to know that. And so that makes her seem crazy. Yeah, I think the parts that I liked most about the book was the horror vibes, the claustrophobic vibes. Like when the ship goes dark and she's like, I don't know where I'm going. The ship is changing and she's hearing uh, 
footsteps and noises, and she doesn't know if it's uh, like the androids or the humans or if it's uh, somebody else. And um, also just like the aspects of her shitty crewmates like gaslighting her. It's like, are you sure you didn't imagine it? Like, are you sure it's because like you haven't uh, got enough sleep? And uh, I don't know. There, there's just like a gothic nature to this spaceship <laughs> that I was really behind. And um, I just feel like I wanted more of that. But then as I kept reading, I was like, oh, it's not that type of book. And <laughs> I, well, I have, guess I felt a little bit let down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get the gothic part of it, especially because this is like they're approaching this haunted planet with a history. And, you know, we see that through the transcripts of the Wyvern, which is the uh, merchant vessel that got stranded on that planet. And then, you know, as at first, it seems like two very separate like storylines. And then they converge when you meet the robot, right? The, the MacGuffin robot that... Um, is like a merged consciousness of like the survey robot and one of the crew members. And that becomes like, that's like the specimen that the ISF is really interested in. Um, and for a time, I thought that was going to be the end game, which is like, everyone's just going to like merge with robots and that's going to be, they're going to become the new dominant species on heels or something. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't quite sure like where the possession was gonna go until like the very end and i was like okay well now she's a spaceship i thought that and... was really cool i I was like that seemed very like cinematic to me which is like she just becomes like i am the spaceship and starts like controlling gravity and stuff um i thought that was like i thought the action scenes in this book were pretty cinematic like lena definitely is really good at writing like action I mean, I think it comes with the territory of writing a space horror thriller <laughs> book. I mean, space horror is already like a genre that is very popular in video games. And <laughs> like that has a lot of action. And um, I, and I guess like one of the other criticisms that I had, and it, ha- it has something to do with like the science as well. It's just like terms like railgun and... Uh, I, I was just like, this sounds not plausible. <laughs> this sounds this sounds fake, even though I know this is a fictional story. Um, and I mean, I could believe that. I mean, maybe it's part of just when you think of a railgun, you think, you think of something huge. But you know, uh, when I play Mass Effect and I fire like the machine gun in that game, that machine gun is essentially a railgun, right? It's accelerating pieces of metal using magnetic force. I too have played Mass Effect, but yeah. I I was also I don't know, maybe it's because that's a video game and this is like a, a sci-fi novel uh written by someone who has like an MFA and I'm like, mm, I don't know. Um but I think that's just like down to preference. That's not like a knock on uh Lena's writing whatsoever. It's maybe. Just- I mean, I I don't expect her to like spend a couple paragraphs explaining the mechanics of the railgun but i guess i i was just ready to accept that that in this far-flung future where advanced androids exist and that they fought several like intergalactic wars that railgun technology has advanced to the point where it can be miniaturized into a handgun Mm. Well, that's neither here nor there it's (laughs) the 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 railgun part is not crucial to the plot but like in the flashback chapters with Park and Glenn, um, you know, she is like one of two students at her school because there is a protest that's happening because all of the teachers, all of the human teachers got replaced by Android teachers. And um, one of the other students, he turns out to be a Android and he was planted in this environment because uh, they want the manufacturers wanted to prove that um, if androids can get along with humans, if humans are comfortable with androids' presence, uh, then there shouldn't be a problem with androids teaching children. And this brings up the theme of like, okay, like, when do we consider androids to be human? And um, it's... It's the reason why Grace has such an affinity with uh, with 
socializing with robots, with AI. And that's why she seems so weird to her crewmates, because they're like, robots don't have feelings. Why are you treating them as if they're people? And I thought that was... um, I thought like the the flashback chapters were probably like some of my favorite because it fleshed out Park's characters more and like just like how androids are treated and how they function in the world. Because just from like the spaceship, I'm like, I'm not quite sure how advanced they are in their intelligence. Yeah. It's nice to know that there were different models. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, the climax of those flashback chapters is... At the end, when she's trying to bring Glenn with her to college, he won't go because he's not allowed to. Because his primary programming, his primary owner is her uncle or not her. And so no matter what she does, no matter what she pleads, he can't go with her. And she learns that all the affection that he's shown on her was part of his programming. Like he was programmed to have emotions, to have a sense of humor, to you know act more human. Um, it reminds me of, did you ever watch Bicentennial Man? the Robin Williams Mm -hmm. movie about the robots. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a story about a robot that kind of learns to be more human. At one point he finds another robot just like him that shows emotions and is able to like kind of joke around and act human. And then, but then he learns that she's able to do so because her, she has an emotion chip. Whereas he's kind of more like a bottom up, like he developed emotions naturally. Uh, but it did remind me of that. And it was such like a, it was a heartbreaking scene because you can see that much like her, like similar, I guess in parallel to her relationship with Full Breach, um, the genuine emotions that she thought she was sharing with someone turned out to be fake or in her mind, like not real. And that's kind of, that's a trauma for her, right? Yeah, that's the reason why she's such an isolationist. But at the same time, she wish she craves belonging. Yeah. And, you know, it brings me back to the fact that she can sympathize with androids because they're looked down on and ostracized for being different, but can't necessarily sympathize with like people who are oppressed economically. It reminds me of not to say like, because the androids here later gain self-determination, um, but like how certain people treat like their pets better than other people. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's really sad that humans who are being oppressed by a private company who are using using them as indentured servants, they can't relate to robots who are do who are pretty much in the same position and aren't getting paid. <laughs> and, yeah. But at the same time, it's because those robots are threatening their survival. If they don't have a job, then they can't support their families. Um, and they're in danger of being laid off, essentially. And in this world, being laid off is a death sentence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, automation itself is not a bad thing. It's a bad thing when a capitalist society uses it to... Uh, to gain profits at the expense of human <laughs> life. What did you think about the robots uh, on the spaceship suddenly becoming like religious? That was creepy. That part was kind of scary because like, I don't know, maybe it's because I didn't grow up with religion. Whenever I see like that sort of like religious fervor or fanaticism, I personally get a little scared. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's yeah, not a comfortable here. feeling, you know? Um, yeah, that was pretty creepy. Yeah, and like the suspense of, um, you know, the, them being like, oh, are you going to, you need to wake the sleeping god. You need to go down to the underworld. And I'm like, this sounds really creepy, but also I'm very curious as to what the <laughs> hell they're talking about. <laughs> I was like, okay, is this like a Cthulhu? This is, did this become like a Cthulhu story? Like, is there some sort of cosmic horror down there? Um, the androids or I guess synthetics as they call themselves later on they're probably the source of most of the horror vibes more than like the space paranoia I I, I mean I guess so I feel like the space paranoia was like scarier for me <laughs> simply because like simply because I'm always like very wary of um, being gaslit 
because <laughs> of personal experiences with people gaslighting me. So I'm just like, oh, man, like this feeling of no one believing you. <laughs> and uh, and then like one by one, your crewmates are having these waking nightmares. Yeah. And people blaming you for them, too. And you're just like, oh, my God, you're stuck in a situation where nobody is on your side <laughs> and you have no way out. And you know? the spaceship is being really, like, really scary because it's going dark and things are changing all the time. So, yeah. You know, at some point, like, you know, early on in the book, I had thought that the twist was going to be that they're all androids. Because, you know, the weird shit started happening after the android mechanic got put on ice. Um, <laughs> but That was something that I, like... I struggled with. I was I, I was just like, why is there only one person for each job on the spaceship? That is a thing that comes up in a conversation that Grace has with um was it with Full Breach? I'm not sure, but they're just like, yeah, it's a little weird from other colonizing missions. They only have one person in each role and there's way too many androids here. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, like I don't know. It's just I even if it was a, a a secret mission that the ISF sent them on, I just like can't believe they only had like one roboticist who is in charge of maintaining all of the robots. And the fact that there are um, the fact that they put Park as the main psychologist after her mentor, uh, Michelle Keller, is pretty much fridged i was just like you already knew that dr keller was going to analyze the sentient robot uh taban in like the basement of the spaceship so they knew that like they're they're going to be left with one psychologist and it's grace who has very poor relations with other human beings i'm like why did you put her I on mean, the ship i thought then? that was explain that she wasn't actually there to i mean a she was there to observe and report and b she was there as a control for an experiment the entire crew was an experiment they were an expendable experiment to go find and figure out what was going on um, like i understand that I she bought, was a control factor but i'm just like you really couldn't like put I mean, a psychologist that actually had better social skills to like pretend to actually be a competent would, psychologist that would require the space governing corporation to care about the well-being of their workers i think if you look at it in terms of just like this is this was a crew of expendable Workers, essentially, including the conscripted one, like because even if you're not conscripted, the company still like you're still employee of the company, and they still view you as like their asset. Like, why would they care? Really, her role there wasn't really her the job that she was going to do. It was just the role that she was going to play in the experiment that the company is. It reminds me of like Alien, right? Where later you figure out that the corporation that owns like the Nostromo, the freighter vessel was sent specifically to get this alien specimen and that the survival of the crew was not important. And in Alien, there was, there was also a small crew of, like, specialists, right? There's only one mechanic, one medical person, one security person. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you if you think about it from the perspective of um, the company really does not care about yeah. any of their workers on the ship. Yeah, that makes sense, but also I'm like, don't you want them to succeed in their mission and getting they can this robot? Send more I feel like, but I feel like that's more money and like a waste of resource. I, I don't know. I'm, You're thinking I'm very logically about like a company that cares about its workers and not just about power and control. No, I don't know. I'm just thinking about like logistics and like the like if you want to succeed in this mission at, and like not waste precious resources and resources also being human hu like human well, lives we already just, saw that the isf does not value human resources there's plenty of people willing to sign away their lives just to like make a meager living but again out in space, like that's right? just wasting money i don't think, Even you, if you, like, just I think consider... you need to think about like the magnitude of like it might seem like a lot of money to us but to the isf it's a drop in the bucket it's not like they're on the most advanced <laughs> ship ever. Even if it's a drop in the bucket, I just feel like it's so wasteful. But anyway, that's well. Think neither, about all yeah, the wasteful, like, like we're like think about all of the exploded rockets that SpaceX has sent into the air. 
that's like billions and trillions of dollars that are just being blown up, right? Yeah, yeah. It just seems like they had planned for this crew to like never make it out. And I'm like, if they never make it out, how are you going to get the robot in the first place? If you don't have the data for the planet to send another crew and for them to be successful, then why would you send such a skeletal crew? Uh, that's where my line of logic is going. But that's, I mean, not, I don't in- think they... that's not integral to the plot. Yeah. That's just me being... I mean, the plot is also, they did not expect the entire crew to mutiny, right? The fact that like... They wanted to send someone to go study this thing. They put together a crew really quickly. But essentially, once they picked it up and determined it'd be safe, like if everyone was doing their jobs, and this is maybe probably corporate hubris too, like they expected to be conscripted to just do their jobs because they sent Sagara there as like enforcement, right? Like Sagara was there to ensure that the conscripted did their jobs under threat of violence. Um, but they did not expect like, a, that there was a mutiny brewing, and B, that the phenomenon on this planet was much more far-reaching than they initially thought. Like, because they thought initially that Taban was just a dude that survived for an extended period of time without resources. They did not know he was a robot until they got there. Yeah. With, with the mutineers, I was like, wow, their plans really got derailed because they thought that this was a normal planet and they could just safely live there and it just turns out that it's an icy hell yeah and it's sad because you can see what they wanted to do they wanted to just find a place for their families where they can live free and their dreams like collapsed on itself with the dimensions <laughs> of the fold yeah. um Again, I was just like, you guys did not consider the variables of your mutiny plan but that's just, you know, they have desperation I mean, and they- did plan they're pinning their hopes a lot on on the unknown <laughs> i mean when you're faced with like the hopelessness of like corporate slavery essentially hope is all you have right like the conscripted on the crew saw this opportunity of like a remote short-staffed mission to a potentially colonizable planet and saw this as like an opportunity to escape um their bondage and that's like, you know, for people that are under oppression, that's that's a hope that everyone has. Everyone hopes one day to be free. Um, and, you know, in this book, the androids essentially gain that want to be free. And, you know, they gain that from, you know, their mind meld with Taban, who wants to, like, get out of that basement, right? I mean, the whole reason why, like, Taban is in that situation is because uh, daily his... Uh, partner his uh co-pilot i guess uh he like he was supposed to retire because he had a bad heart and this was supposed to be his last mission and he's been saving up money to get a new heart but um when they land when they accidentally stumble upon eos he's like hey this is a new planet i can somehow leverage this so that i can get money from isf and I mean, it's the same. It's like, well, that's a desperation that really was not that. That's an idea. That's a plan that was not well thought out in terms of survival. I mean, it's the same. It's the same hope that the members, the crew members of the Decalion have, which is we need leverage to get out of our lot in life. This is an opportunity for us. We don't know what it is, but it's a chance, and they're all willing to put their lives on the line for that chance. And, you know, that's all revolution really is born out of like that, that hope, right? That hope that there's a chance that there will be change, that people can self-determinate and to have the right to. The book doesn't resolve that, but that is a tension that will always be present, whether you're a corporate slave or like a sentient AI, right? And yeah, in I don't the think end, the I, humans I less, don't get... In the end, the humans don't really have full freedom. Only the androids do because they're able to like live on this new planet, uh, whereas like the rest of the crew have to go back to ISF. And that's half the, the I mean, mutineers are are dead. So I mean, I kind of feel like at the end, since they're on this planet, they're all going to end up like mind melting with each other. But the crew is planning to leave, right? And like, like, but rescue won't come for like a few weeks. 
the ship is can't fly anymore. I mean, I guess. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I, I mean, chances are they would all mind meld together. Which, you know, I, I know a lot of, there, there were a couple of complaints in reviews saying like, oh, the ending is not really, like, you don't really know what's going to happen other than, you know, they're stuck on this planet. And, uh, I mean, I'm it, okay with the not resolving. Yeah, like same that. here. I mean, essentially the singularity has already happened on this ship, right? So this might be, this might be the beginning of the downfall of humanity, really. Yeah, Maybe. It's, it's, yeah, I don't know. Like, if you want a hopeful ending, I guess you can look at it from the perspective of the androids being like, oh, they, they're free from their human slave, human slavers. Uh, whereas, like, with the humans, you're like, well, what about them? <laughs> like, <laughs> what about their families? And what about, like, their freedom? Are they, like, completely free from the ISF? Like, are, are they going to be able to, survive on this planet for the next couple weeks until rescue arrives so it's i mean there's a lot of unanswered questions and i know that's like the whole point of the ending so i'm not like too like disappointed by that yeah i mean i have no problem with that ending i mean it's it's everyone it depends on your preference um i kind of wish that it wasn't like the whole merging thing wasn't called unity reign uh, but that's just semantics. I'm like, oh god, Unity Rain. That sounds so uncool. But <laughs> uh, whatever, I get the concept. Uh, yeah. yeah, like for me, like my my main critiques is, uh, I guess, like the cosmetic science in this book, and also um, I feel like there wasn't a main focus. I felt like there was too many things going on, but that can just you know, be up to preference. Um, I wanted more creepy vibes, but that's not the, that's not the book. Like that's not the book that Lena wrote. And I guess like for me, like it was really hard for me to get through the first third of the book because I felt like it was a little bit slow. It was around like the 60% mark where I was like, okay, things are finally kicking in. Like, like things are being creepy like there's like this mystery that's happening no one is safe like you don't know who to trust this is the kind of uh book that i expected going in so yeah i think it just depends on your preferences and what you expect the book to be when you like first jump in and yeah i mean i like i had mixed feelings about the book so like i said different from marvin yeah, I actually, I thought the book was paced really well. I thought the mystery was paced pretty well. I like that we got a lot of world building those first few chapters. And I was really fascinated by the world that Lena was was building here. But I, I can see why, because the action doesn't really kick off until like halfway through when everything starts like popping off. Yeah, and this book is like 355 pages. So 60% of the way through is is quite a number of pages until you get to the the action uh, of the book. Yeah. I guess, um, I guess for me, the mystery was enough to get me through that. And like the fascination with just the, like, I like that we jumped around and like started getting pieces put together and there's a lot of things being set up. Um, but again, yeah, that's probably preference to, for us as well. Like I, I like that stuff. So um, I, yeah, I wanted more creepy vibes. I wanted the more like, I wanted more paranoia, I wanted more uncertainty in the book, uh, but it just seemed more like a book that uh, goes into the themes of of like self actualization, differences between humans and androids. It it dives into a lot of themes, and I was like, okay, well, I just wanted like a thriller book that's set in a spaceship, and I just felt like the themes kind of made the pacing a little bit wonky. I feel like I wouldn't have this critique if the book was like extra long, if it was like 600 pages and the world building was like really in depth with a lot of detail. Um, I feel like I wouldn't have this uh, critique or if it was a much shorter book and it focused more on like the thriller aspect. So the fact that it was kind of like in the middle, that's why 
I have more of a mixed feeling about it. But that seems to be the consensus, it, the general consensus about this book, um, as I was like looking at reviews from critics and also uh, book bloggers. Yeah, there was definitely a split audience on um, Goodreads um, because there are just as many people who r- really liked the book and gave it like a pretty good review. So um, split audience in reviews and I guess split audience on this podcast as well, because I, I really did enjoy the book and I thought. I thought everything, like, it, it was a lot. There was a lot of things going on, but I liked how they all came together. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Are you a Marvin know, we, or we you oft- a Lira? I mean, we often say, like, you, you've you said on this podcast that you have a higher tolerance for anime bullshit. And I feel like towards the end of the book, I was like, this is getting really, <laughs> like, really anime. And I'm not sure if I'm on board with that. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. You're either me or or Marvin when it comes to reading this book. I feel like that's that's just like the general consensus from what I've seen. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess with that, that'll do it for our discussion of We Have Always Been Here by Lena Wynn. Um, if you've also finished the book and have some thoughts, um, or if you want to chime in and say whose side you're on, um, please sound off on our Goodreads forum or on our Discord if you're a um, Books and Boba Patreon member. Um, as always, we do appreciate your support. I guess with that, um, we are now into the month of July. And as we promised, you know, every quarter we'll pick a book based on suggestions from our Patreon um, subscribers. And thank you to everyone who sent in suggestions for our July pick. And so our July 2023 book club pick is The Imaginary Lives of James Ponicky by Tina Macaretti. Um, it is a historical fiction about a young Maori orphan who was raised by missionaries um, and wants to see the world and ends up following an English artist back to London to become a living exhibit. Um, thank you to Patreon member J.L. Alviso for the suggestion. And yeah, this is our first book written by a Pacifica author that we've read in a while. So I'm excited to um, dive into it. Yeah, yeah. And this book is recent, too. It came out in 2020. Yeah. Or at least the paperback came out in 2020. I don't know about the hardcover. Yeah. Uh, but like that that has been a thing that I've struggled with in finding books by Pacifica authors because so many that have been recommended to me are out of print or they came out like in like the 1980s and I'm like, okay, well, it's not reflective of um the like indigenous experience now. So I'm really glad that we were recommended this book. I'm uh, pretty excited to go into it. So thank you for the suggestion. And yay. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a change of pace once again. Yeah. We we keep we shake things up all the time on this show. <laughs> yeah. So um, as you read along with us, if you have any thoughts to share, um, please let us know on Goodreads or on our Discord. As always, we'd love to include the thoughts of our members on our podcast whenever possible. And yeah, thanks for joining us for our discussion of our July 2023 book club pick. Um, We'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Life gets a little crazy sometimes. Sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's beautiful, and sometimes it can just piss us off. Enter First of All Podcast. It's a safe space for real conversations about the things that we all struggle with, celebrate, contemplate, and work through in our daily lives. I'm your host, Mindy Chang. I'm an actor, filmmaker, and entrepreneur with a colorful background, 
full life and brilliant friends who I love to unpack life with to share with all of you. They are everyday people like you and me, ranging from award-winning artists, cultural icons, powerful CEOs, my hilarious childhood friends, and even my mom. Tune in for honest conversations on mental health, dating, sex, family, career, culture, and everything in between. Listen to First of All wherever you find podcasts. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective.